Hello, so nice to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining us um, here for a really provocative and I think urgent conversation that will um, integrate poetics and mental health and healing and um, language. And we are here um, just on the aftermath of this tragedy in this country of, um, of a kind of uh, inflection of, of, of trauma on women's bodies that will be felt into generations. And um, I think that Cynthia's book, which is really a book about, about her, her aunt, who's uh, you know, tragically died from suicide many, many, many years ago, but still this way of thinking about um, what women are holding in our bodies. And when, when we have state sanctioned violence um, being inflicted on us, um, these, this kind of book and this kind of conversation feels very urgent. Um, into this moment. Um, so Cynthia and I are, are sitting in Cynthia's beautiful garden in the unceded um, territory of the um, Wapanawak in Provincetown, Massachusetts, um, site of another, so many different kinds of, of historical traumas. And we are telling these stories um, as a means of, of not offending the spirits that are already living here, having told many, many stories upon many, many generations in many, many realms of physical and, and spirit. And thank you all so much for, for being with us here in the other sphere of, of Zoom. Um, thank you for being here. So I just am gonna begin just sort of introducing Cynthia a little bit, really just more thinking of thinking through um, the book, which is, you've probably seen the, the cover of it, really, really beautiful. I learned that um, the cover was actually a beautiful design of her, of her daughter's Ruby. So um, that is really special to have, to have, have that uh, connection to your daughter's work. Um, when I think about this idea of, of haunting um, it becomes a kind of idea of a, of a sort of uh, akin to a kind of possession into which you have no other choice but to see the story through. The story's coming through you, but in, an, in a way that is, is, not of your own, is not of your own choice. And one of the things that this book, which I think is so unique, gets at is not just the story of the haunting, but the story of your body having received it in all of these different ways and your, the trauma that you yourself and the breakdown that you yourself suffered in, in response to having, having been a part of somebody else's story, somebody else's unfinished story that was then literally passed down to you and into, an, into a, your um, body. So this book, Sleeping in the Dead Girl's Room, um, is, is telling that story, but it's telling it also in poetic form which is a fragmented form. It's a story that can't be told really. I mean, it could be told in a traditional narrative. Mm -hmm. You could just tell the story, but there's something about the way that you're telling it through poetic form that actually makes the fragmentation and the breakdown of the interchange between your body and the body of your aunt come into this sort of really intense relationship to, to language. Um, as a, as a fragmented system, not one that's easily told. This is not an easy story to tell. You can't just, it's not like a beginning, a middle and an end that you just, that you just tell. Um, and um, so just means of introduction, Cynthia is, is a poet, um, also a editor of um, Pangris Literary Magazine, something maybe those in the community could submit work to in the definitely, future. Definitely. Um, so we'll send out some information about that. Um, so I guess a couple of quotes that really are resonating for me, just to sort of begin to get you into a space of talking through this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to re try. I feel like when you publish a book like this, that is about a core trauma, really a, a core trauma that caused a breakdown in your life. Like mm -hmm. this is bold. This is, um, you know, very courageous to bring this book in and then to have to continue talking about it <laughs> over and over again. But, um, a couple of beautiful quotes from the book. You could say I was there. 
you repeat that you could you could say I was there and me by there you're speaking of really the death of your aunt mm -hmm. the the moment that she left that she took her took her life in an extreme state of of duress mm -hmm. um and then another one is the she who is not the I haunts and blesses so to be haunted and blessed at mm -hmm. the same time yep. you know so maybe you can just so Cynthia will speak a little bit about the book and just whatever's resonating for her in this moment. Um, and then we'll have a little back and forth and we'll hear, hear some poems and then end with some questions or comments. Sounds wonderful. Hi, so everybody. where are you in relation to this book right now? Where am I in relation to the book? Well, yeah. um, first of all, I wanna thank Kristen Kay for, um, for doing this and for coming here. And um, it's really an honor to, to be here. Um, where I am in relation to the book is it came out in January. It took me about five years to write it. And I was telling Kay this morning that I didn't, people were saying, oh, that must have been really intense or that must have been so hard while you were writing it. And I didn't feel that way. I just was writing it and I was into it. But um, the, having the book out there now and reading from it and talking about it, I don't feel re-traumatized for sure, but I feel like a much more emotional, it's like, it's really, it's, I, I don't know how to say it. It's like unsayable, but I do feel more emotional about it than I did when I was writing it. And I, and that may have something to do with the haunting. I don't know. Um, while I was writing it, I think for a lot of that time, I was in a, in a state, a good state of receptivity and uh, learning and know, knowing and not knowing and researching and all of the things that that happened. And I mentioned um, to Kay that, you know, I started this project or book or, um, or poems thinking about my time being in a mental hospital, being diagnosed with um, manic depression, having had a lifetime of many depressions. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of exploring all of that. And that's when my aunt came to me because as I was thinking about that and writing about it, I, I just had the flash of memory that she came to me while I was there. And I had sort of buried that, I guess. I, and so that kind of opened me up to uh, the way that this book started to evolve. Because, and just to clarify that your your aunt is your name, you were named her full name, Cynthia yes. Barger yeah. was her name. Yeah. Cynthia May Barger. So the, yeah. I, a little backstory is that my mother, my father's sister was Cynthia May Barger. My mother was pregnant with me when she died at age 18 and she it sounds pretty much like it was suicide but uh the family didn't talk first of all they heart they didn't talk about it at all but they did not acknowledge that and there was no no conversation about her ever i, I never i couldn't say who is this Cynthia that I'm named for. Mm -hmm. um, I just, it was just like one of those don't go there things. So um, I then remembered that she came to me and then I remembered talking to my mother. I was on a furlough from the mental hospital and we went for Chinese food. And I, you know, that came back to me that I asked my mother, did she kill herself? And my mother said, yes. Um, when I, when my, when I was born, my parents had already moved into the house where this death happened. And that's where I was brought. And I was, my room as an infant until I was uh, five years old was the dead girl's room. So, you know, I think mm -hmm. <laughs> I might've absorbed quite a bit. Yes. And, um, and again, I didn't, I just didn't know. And I didn't know what was sort of wrong with me. You know, it was like, okay, depression. You know, lots of people have depression. Uh, later on, my mother told me that, you know, they were worried about me because of her. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
but nobody ever said that. It was just sort of like a background jibber jabber thing. And I just think it's an interesting perspective on on what they call mental health, i.e. these labels of depression, of bipolar, of this, of that, mm -hmm. the struggles that, that you have. And, and it makes it seem like it's your depression, yeah. your mental illness, right. your situation, you know, but really there is ancestral trauma that is inherited and passed down yeah. in all sorts of direct ways, but also sideways mm -hmm. ways and being, having a namesake um, that you're going to be unconsciously directed towards is going to have an effect it a name is very important is. to how to to how a, a life unfolds in that way and yes. so just to i just am so moved by this idea of of you know in in reiki there's a practice of of you know brush off the brush off the you know, the, the residue of the, of the, any of the spirits that are clinging to you, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can kind of be fully present in this moment. Yeah. Um, and it seems like that, that you had a spirit clinging to I, you. I, yeah. I did. In, in no uncertain terms that, that you as a very sensitive artistic person took on without quite understanding exactly what that was and what it quote unquote wanted. And here we now have a story that's your story right. simultaneously with her story, how moving is that? It's just so, such a moving testament to the human spirit. Well, thank you, thanks, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, love, I love the way you think about that. And I, I, just even this morning when we were talking, I felt like you, I learned something about myself when you talked about this, you know, I, I've heard that, I've heard that from um, massage therapists and acupuncturists, you know, what's going on with you? And I would say, mm. well, this, 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 and, you know, one, and, the, and, but they're thinking that I needed to clear it, but, but I couldn't, like, you don't just clear something like that. I, I, to me, I didn't even know what that meant. And I think the writing of this book has cleared it in so many, on so many levels, you right. know, I really, right. I do. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't, guarantee but I mainly I think that's right I feel like I've I've come to terms with my family also because I was for a while like why did you do this how how stupid are you you know <laughs> and uh and then not talk about it right you know. right right is it right 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 yeah. um and as we're writers here and artists here who are many many of us are here working on our own um memoirs or working through these stories um, that have been passed down or that, that we've received in all these different ways coming into and around poetic form. And I was also really struck by, um, like, you know, I know you, you say, well, she came to me and I, it, you know, sort of then asked my mom, is this what happened? But there was another thing that came to you. And I, I'm just curious about that, which is the picture of Sylvia Plath on Winthrop Beach the exact beach um, where where your aunt uh, died. Um, so so you saw this picture of Sylvia Plath in a literary class, maybe, or of some. Or, uh, was it a book? No, that no you the had, very was, the new biography that came out, this thousand page book. So more recently, we have very recently. Okay, and okay. it has all these photos of Sylvia Amazing. Plath, and some of them are on Winthrop Beach, which was the town. Winthrop was the town yeah. that we lived in. So that's another interesting kind of haunting that yes. idea that there's these cross sections that are yes. happening in the in, in in all sorts of different realms of you as a poet yes coming into relationship with sylvia platt coming yes. into relationship with this beach the landscape the land the land itself the the traumatized land right. of this land which, right. which is a land of violence yeah um so that's just another it is. aspect, and I hope maybe later you'll read that poem because I think that's such a the Sylvia Plath poem is really gorgeous in in this Thank book. You. And I just wouldn't about Sylvia Plath. I was um, I I think I've been haunted by Sylvia Plath as well for not that I write like her, <laughs> but um, but I read the Bell Jar when I was when it came out. I was fifteen years old, and I you know mm. it was like my Bible. I and I you know I just connected with it way before I connected with her poetry right and and then I found out um, that she had lived in the same town that I lived in and 
you know, my mother's friend said, oh yeah, I knew her mother, Aurelia, blah, 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 you know, and it was just like, it was more, it, it, it was bigger than it would have been somehow. It was like, something's going on here. Well, that's precisely what I'm trying to say to yeah. us as writers and as artists um, is, you know, what are the books that you are called to? Um, and it's like, you could think about that as well, um, just kind of arbitrary or just sort of, well, you know, but the fact of the matter is that there's a hundred million books on the planet. Mm -hmm. You were deeply called to that one. And then later on in your life, it opened up this whole deep, deep, deep understanding of mm -hmm. your relationship to place, to your aunt, mm -hmm. to your story. Th this book kind of seems to coming through the portal of the Sylvia Plath. And that was a seed that was planted when you were 15 years old. So the haunting really begins with the bell jar, right? It really begins, it really begins like, yes. wait a minute, there's a resonance here. There's something here that I need to know. Yes. There's somewhere that I need to go. Um, and I don't know what that is right now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take 40, 50 years to unfurl itself yes. and to find itself. Yes. But that how important is it as artists and writers that we tend to those residues that we're attracted to yes. and not think of them as arbitrary but right. is actually like let me just hold this for a little while yeah yeah and be and be patient and be patient i you know i i could not have you know i couldn't have done this until i did it and um mm -hmm. and i always think it's interesting my mother died in april of 2016 and i actually started working on this as a book project three months later got it and yeah you know i, I would have wished to have her around for many reasons. I certainly think she could have told me more things, but mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. couldn't go there until both of my parents were gone, I think. You know, I just, right. And for sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, let's go there now. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, is the sound okay? Everybody can hear right. us with the birds. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are we, um, lots of guests. Yes. joining us here in the garden yes so so cynthia will read read a little while I'll read which a will while. be such a treat yeah and um, i'm just going to tell you that um there is this uh i do this thing i it came to me the she who is the i the i who is not the she and so you'll hear that um showing up in a lot of these pieces so the first poem in the book um is called creative nonfiction. And it's in eight parts, and, and I'll read that to you. Creative nonfiction. One, you who is the I are the patient. You and your brother stand in the back of the ambulance. No stretcher, no straps this gray February day. No sirens, no careening down Storo Drive or up the Jamaica Way. Your brother pleads, why are you acting like this? It's not funny. He walks in the door of the mental hospital with you. Your father is there, pacing, does not look at you. You offer him a wallet-sized photo of the Swami, your guru. Hope it will calm him down. He says, sign the yellow form, make it voluntary. You sign. Despite the shot in the emergency room at the regular hospital, you are still high. They lock you in a ward. You have nothing, no books, no hairbrush, no glasses, no keys. This place is locked up tight. Alarm blinks, alarms blink and blare when you try to open the door. Someone always watches, always sees. This is not sad for you. You are the one who laughs, the only one. An adventure, like an acid trip. You have no key. Key is not a metaphor. Two. Two. The other Cynthia, the she who is not the I, visits, vapor, the she is vapor, faceless funnel, she vanishes. Three, the she who is not the I, haunts and blesses. The I is driftwood covered with barnacles, as is the she. The she is organza, drenched, illuminated, as is the I. Who knows this? Is the haunting a fact? Is the blessing a truth? The she appears to be sleeping. The I is sleeping. The she is gone. 
is this what truth is always an echo not twins because the i is a body the she is vapor there are no vapor body twins how do you know this on the recording your brother asks your mother who says my in-laws had lost their daughter we named our daughter after her my in-laws my in-laws Four. Upon release, the I who is me is a body whose long hair smells like the mental hospital dumbwaiter. I get a buzz cut from a friend. My cousin asks, did they buzz your hair off in that place? Disbelieves me when I claim it's a fashion choice. Lithium makes the body grow fat. I am round and shorn and will stay like that for years. Eat cookies all day long, M&Ms every color, pair alcohol and lithium and puke out the car window. Soon we'll renounce Jack Daniels, drive remove, later lithium. Mine is a body in revolt. It asks forgiveness, remembers vapor, misses vapor. Five, cookies. On the recording, your mother says she didn't want you eating cookies all day long. All day long? Did the I eat them all day long? You know you did. Is it too bad your brother didn't ask your father? Your father would not have answered. Your father locked the dead she away. He would have said, you don't need to know. Stop asking questions. Too many questions. You know your father. Or do you? The details and the pictures come later. Six, maybe one picture, Sylvia Plath on Winter Beach, sunbathing on the rocks, right where you see the she in the sun on her last day. You look at the picture of Sylvia Plath in a book. Your mind holds the picture of the she. You know everything or think you do about Sylvia Plath. You know nothing about the she, or maybe it's the other way around, a summing, a haunting. Seven, listen, mosquitoes, rain and high tide, they hatch in the marsh among the cattails, larvae attached to the roots, submerge until mature. Let's name them scourge, known to enter home solo or coupled at night, these vampiric bugles devil our ears, sneak between the balusters, feast to blood drunk. And then let's not name the she, shh, shh, who comes when they call the I, nor the I who comes when they call the she. Shh, shh. Eight, look, the first spring robin lights upon the rusted monkey sculpture, look, crocuses cluster purple in the sandy ditch by my back door. If you, the she who is not the I, are traveling through, give me a sign. Be the fox that slinks across my lawn. Rustle the vinca on the knoll. Tie a ribbon on the rusted monkey's prehensile tail. Or frolic with the hatchlings in the birdhouse among lint and twigs before you emerge covered in nursery dust to tell me our story. So that was creative nonfiction. And um, the next poem I thought I would read is um, called My Aunt Talks to Sylvia Plath. And the epigraph is from Sylvia Plath's uh, poem, Point Shirley, which is in Winthrop what the sluttish rutted sea could do. Your sluttish rutted sea churned up trouble for our families. Some call Winthrop by the sea a fitting childhood home for you. Your words embalmed with moist and misty beach breaths razored like the clams we love to dig. I left behind little proof of that place, fitting or not fitting. Your grandmother's Point Shirley geranium bed with a hurricane pounded shark startled six-year-old you. While a mile away and three years older, I watched tall pines sway, dip, 
crack in my front yard, hostas airborne, their leaves like propellers on the plains whose lights we both craved landing nightly at Logan. After the storm, did I push you on the swing at Ingleside Park? Did our mothers, Dorothy and Aurelia, nod, never speak, each already afraid? When the bell rang, I believe it was you who chased me up the hill to the Willis School. I chose to die during an August heat wave. You may have heard it was gas. Um, so the next three poems I'm going to read have some visuals. So um, this poem is a redacted obituary um, from one of the local papers when my aunt died. And um, it, it's companion, and I'll show you the other poem, with another um, sort of found documentary poem. And they contradict each other. Originally, this poem was called uh, Apparently, and the other poem is called Presumably. But just visually, I just kept it, Gas Kills Girl in Winthrop. Winthrop, August 25th, INS. 18-year-old in her home, gas water heater, the girl, Cynthia Bogger, found by family, medical examiner performed autopsy, family expressed belief accidental, said the girl swimming most of day, apparently planned a bath, her body apparently overcome by gas. And then this um, is her death certificate, which says, presume it's an odd, it, cause of death, and it says presumably suicidal, and it asks if there was an autopsy, and it says there was no autopsy. Mm -hmm. So right away, you know, you go to documents for truth, and <laughs> what do you find? So I have just, you'll see that poem, the she who died by gas, a suicide, an accident, family and medical examiner at odds, autopsy or not. They do concur it occurred at home, 254 Maine. The she who was I and did not die lived there, slept in the dead girl's room. And then the last one I'm going to read, and just look at that picture for a minute. And this is called Nine Days Before Your Death. One, this photo, unposed, black and white, Smile, lingers seductive, fresh, no disquiet in your eyes. Two, your hair kerchiefed, a full, a few curls undone, reminders, this is summer. Three, summer captures the swell of your breasts, the rump, rumpled ruffle under your sunlit clavicle. You grip four, you grip a vanilla cone, one scoop, it drips, speckles your fingers. Five, smitten with the one behind the camera. Six, beautiful, not because we are blood, no, not that desire to imbue one's dead kin with beauty. Seven, everlasting girl grace, so unlike our women, frowsy uterine ancestors, their loose house dresses. Eight, a tall tree behind you looms. Nine, Composed, you walk toward me, almost out of frame. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you. It's so wonderful, you know, just to have the language come into because there's one thing to have a conversation, but to have that have that language, which really is um, so obviously vital. So it's it's, a, it's a, a work coming through the oracle of, of poetry. Um, so you mentioned, you know, we had a conversation earlier just about just the sort of residues that kind of the spirits can sometimes inflict on us that we then absorb into our bodies. But you mentioned something else, which is the flip side of that, which is research. Um, and that, um, and again, I think so many of us here are also in that 
realm of research of whether working on dissertations or long books or um, ethnographies or, um, uh, or, or investigative poetic projects and such. Um, and again, to me, the research is also, you're being called toward that. Mm -hmm. There's a billion things you could research. You could research azaleas, you, you could research <laughs> compost, you could research you know, the, the maritime industry as Charles Olson did in the same area. Um, but you're called towards some kind of research. And it's no matter what that research is, no matter how academic, again, why? Because there's something that the research is trying to direct you towards your unconscious or whatever you want to call it is being directed and moved towards this inquiry, this question that you're asking. And so um, finding the materials, you said the documents, you're looking for the truth. And of course, we know <laughs> that, that, that we don't, the truth is not uh, present except for through the fragmentation of language. Right. That's where the truth is. That's right. But tell us a little bit about this research that you had to do to mm -hmm. kind of just come into not just this book, but also just the research that enabled your, your own project, your self project to reveal itself. Um, good, that's a really good question. Well, um, I started, as I think I said earlier, I started writing about my experiences um, being mentally ill, being labeled mentally ill. <laughs> Maybe sing um, a little bit louder. But being labeled mentally yeah. ill. And um, and I the first thing I did was ask, uh, ask for my records from that time, my hospital records. And um, that was the first research I did. And um, it was very strange to, to see what they wrote about me. And also the fact that it was so minimal, really, what they wrote. It wasn't it wasn't very insightful. It felt very kind of pro forma. But that was the first research I did. And then um, when my mother died, I got all of her albums and letters and many, many things. And I went through them all and kind of didn't exactly categorize them or catalog them, but anything related to my aunt, I pulled out. Um, and that really got me looking at those photos. I had seen a few photos of her. There was one on the piano in the house, kind of a graduation picture, but you, you couldn't ask about it. And my grandmother wore a locket around her neck with a picture of her, of her daughter. Mm -hmm. And I had asked her you know, a few times, like, who is that? And she would say, that's my Cindy. She's, has a, she's in a better place now. You know, that was it. But so what was a better place? I, I didn't know. And, and I didn't, you know, I'm a curious person, but in that childhood time, I wasn't, there was no opening for me to, act, to continue the conversation. And that probably had a lot to do with sort of just mm -hmm. stuffing it all in. So um, I went to get her death certificate. That was another thing I wanted to do because I was really curious what it would say and that in itself was a very strange experience because at first I went to Winthrop Town Hall hmm. and um, and they said no all of our records are being digitized and you have to go to this place in Boston so I went to the place in Boston and I had to fill out a form and it's you know your full name Cynthia May Barger and then the death certificate that you want <laughs> Cynthia May Barger and just that, you know, wow. it's so many of those kinds of things. Um, so then I got the death certificate and I had started doing, I knew there were probably were obituaries, although nobody, I didn't see them in anybody's papers. So I found obituaries online um, and I found a very strange thing that turned out not to be real. I found the record of the cemetery where she's buried and I had been to that cemetery with family and on the thing about when she died it said she died may 1 1947 and that was insane to me because i was born may 1 1948 and i don't know why it says that but she didn't die in may she mm -hmm. died in august 
So that any time I would look for things, it would just mm. open up doors. And the final mm. thing I'll just mm. say is that um, in my family is strange, and my father's brother married a first cousin. Mm. Uh, their mothers are sisters, so that was a little interesting. And that aunt slash cousin of mine uh, was still alive when I was sort of in the middle of this project and I decided to go visit her and ask her. And she gave, she pulled out all of her documents and papers and, and I went through them and she said I could take whatever I wanted. So I kind of quickly saw what I didn't, hadn't seen and took those. And then I said, so what do you remember? And she said, well, you've heard those rumors, haven't you? And I said, no. And she said, well, some people thought she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that was like, oh, really? Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all she said. And, and she didn't have a lot more to say. So I didn't have a lot of people to speak to, but I had a lot of things to look at. Right. You know, wow. so. And thank you, that circles us back to the present moment that we opened with. The law, the new law of the land, mm -hmm. where um, women are, have we need to somehow just magically surrender our bodies to this new land, into which, if we receive that, uh, then what are we going to do? Right. right. Um, and so many of us in our ancestry, I think, have have those women, yes, um, who who had no choice but to end their lives. Yeah. So it's in, it's yeah. I did dedicate the book to, um, to for all the women and girls whose stories were buried with them. Oh, yes. So, yes. You yes. Know, Thank you. I'm, that's where my head is at. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we just want to offer a, a writing prompt, um, not to do right now. It's, it, it, I don't think it'll be really um, uh, so, so useful to do that on, on the Zoom without kind of knowing the configuration of, of souls who are present. But um, you had a, a, a prompt um, that was offered to you with a, through a creative writing instructor at one point that opened up a portal. Yeah. Um, so, and I think I, I and this is a, a very powerful one for our work with, with trans actually. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go ahead and, and give the prompt. I'll show, after you give it, I'll, I'll show what, okay. what your, um, okay. So um, I took this uh, workshop with uh, the poet and memoirist, Brian Turner, and he gave us this prompt and we, we actually did it in the class. It was, you know, five day class. And he said, everybody was working on either poetic memoirs or memoir, memoir prose memoirs. And so he's, wherever the story started, whatever the house was, draw that house and then go through and identify the rooms and just jot notes, you know, what what happened there. And um, I don't know if you, if you can see it, but the, I just had, this was very much in the beginning of this project, driveway under the dining room and then basement where, wait, I have to give you Actually, maybe you could just read this as if it's I'll a poem. It. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Okay. Grandfather's chair, worn brocade. Her room. Grandparents' room. TV, screen porch, living room, and then in the living room, her piano. On the screen porch, a glider, which is maybe where I read Sylvia Plath. Attic hat boxes with her things, my room, her room, my parents' room, the kitchen, the dining room where I played solitaire, the laundry downstairs in the basement, and, and then it says basement where she gassed herself. Mm. So it's very, you know, not in depth and very schematic and I really didn't know what it would lead to. It, yeah. But but when you di were doing that, you see, you were in a very deep trance. Yeah, you were in you were in the you were in the trance of. I mean that 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 is really deep, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, and because 
even though the drawing itself seems just schematic and not really right. so interesting or just kind of note little notes the world of phenomena that opened up into your mind and body um, must have been viscerally felt as you were absorbed i bet you that 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 you know an um a door could have slammed right behind you and you wouldn't have heard right. it when you were in that right. space. Yeah, and it was very a, powerful it was. prompt. And it was amazing because I was with all these people I never met before mm -hmm. and we were all doing this and it was very, very quiet and just, right. yeah. you know, we were each in our own yeah. place. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, so once again, to think of that, this is for all of you, an offering for you. To think about, um, you know, whatever it is that you are working on or moving towards in in this in in your story, and to uh, it's kind of drawing the origin of that mm -hmm. landscape. I mean, it's, it also could also be a map. I've um, done it that way as well, mm -hmm. drawing a map of like the area as another way of yes. so the house. There's the house, and then there's the larger area. You know, Winthrop Beach yes, and all we did, of we also all did of that. that. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you know, with in hypnosis, we talk about you know the how when you know if you're too zooming in too much, like you're looking, looking, looking. The, that idea of research, you're going and you're finding these documents, and you're you're you know that's a real focus. Yeah. But the actual work begins to actually happen when you zoom out mm -hmm. from that focus and into the periphery, the right. cora. Um, which is the the periphery, the outside, the outskirts of the thing itself. Mm -hmm. That that is the space into which the work of art can begin to come through. Yes. Um, so the research then can come into that porously, just sort of come in. But it it, it is not the poem itself. No. The poem itself begins in Cora, which is, the, and that prompt is so easy. And it's like you don't need a lot of you don't have to have uh, you know go under you know, <laughs> you know you just literally begin drawing your childhood home yeah and wow right you're yeah. there yeah. and all of the details and the smells and the sights yeah. and the little things on the the pictures on the wall and right. the things that again that you unconsciously you have absorbed everything as a child yeah and it um, all comes back. It all comes back in that moment, whether you yeah. can capture it in a little drawing or not. No, none of it got captured in the drawing. Nothing. I will say right. that. But um, but it got captured it in, the, in book. the book. And I even right. have a poem, a 